Thank you very much. Um, so good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today for a webinar on um, Bureau of Land Management's Rapid Eco Regional Assessments, um, or REAs, if you've heard them called that. Um, BLM recently has been transitioning to a landscape management approach um, and really working across jurisdictions and, and boundaries within uh, eco regions. Um, this approach has several components, but the initial step is to conduct eco-regional assessments. And Elroy Masters is going to be presenting for us today. Elroy is the biological program lead at BLM's Arizona State Office. He's been involved in several REAs um, in the geography of the desert LCC. And BLM's currently in the process of completing or has completed REAs um, that can provide information for all of our partners within the desert LCC geography for the Central Basin and Range Area, the Chihuahuan Desert, the Mojave Basin and Range Area, the Sonoran Desert, and currently they have just begun the Madrian Archipelago region. As a reminder, we will be recording the webinar today and then also making the webinar available online if folks would like to take a look at it later or pass it on to colleagues. Please remember to mute your phones and please do not put us on hold or we will all be listening to your hold music. So if you need to take another call, please hang up and call back into the conference line. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn it over and introduce um, El Ray. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I guess as we move through, um, there'll be a couple of spots I'll pause. Uh, we've got a lot of information to cover. It was kind of actually difficult to kind of pull it down into a few slides to, to initiate. It's a lot of information. But we'll we'll be kind of moving between the slide presentation and then some um, live live demos that I hope will work for us this morning in the presentation. Um, so I'll just go ahead and get started. If there's questions, I don't have the raise your hand button. I'm assuming, Genevieve, you see that? or I will monitor the chat button. So if you do have questions and you want to put them into the pa uh, chat button, um, I will I, I will help facilitate that this morning. Okay. And I'll just go ahead and get started. So, again, good morning, Elroy. My name is Elroy Masters with the BLM here at the Arizona State Office. And I'll, so to, the purpose of today's discussion is to discuss what is an what is an rapid regional assessment and how can um, REAs help with critical management questions that you guys are are wrestling with um, in the LCC's um, working groups. So the vision for BLM's landscape approach. Um, <clears throat> traditionally, BLM focused a lot of its efforts on more local or uh, project-specific type um, decisions. Um, and this is a chance for us to start looking at a more larger landscape of, um, and figuring out how our decisions fit within that landscape and how it may inform future decisions. Um, the REAs, a big focus of the REAs is to keep it at the landscape scale. And it's not that we will we um, we will not look at local issues. We still would do our current planning and dealing with current, you know, permits and issues that come into our field office at the local scale. But this is a chance for us to look broader and see how we can improve practice or identify resources that we may have missed at a local scale. There are four components to BLM's landscape approach. Rapid Eco-Regional Assessments are the first or the initial phase. phase. After you complete an assessment, um, the Bureau or BLM will give out eco-regional direction to the field, and then we will implement that um, direction, and which leads us to the fourth is monitoring. And all along the process, science, science integration is a big part. And we're looking to partner with you know, the LCCs and the um, Climate Science Centers to help us with that integration. Um, we will, there's different ways to look at science. Um, science as informing the tools we use and then also helping us interpret the information that we get from some of these landscape assessments. So there's a lot of different ways to look at how we integrate science. But that's a pro that's, science integration is a part of the process at all levels. The landscape approach as it relates to other issues, uh, um, other initiatives, sorry about that. Um, the DOI climate change adaptation plan applies to all these bureaus. So 
uh, REAs is our step at trying to, you know, figure out BLM's um, process or how we will address climate change. Um, the U.S. Forest Service here locally between Arizona and New Mexico completed their integrated landscape assessment project. And then you also have the Western governors working on their crucial habitat assessment tools, which is um, west-wide, 17 states working on that effort at the state level. And the goal is to at, you know, look for opportunities to integrate these efforts and not duplicate the things we're working on. What is a rapid equilibrium assessment? So they're supposed to be rapid. We started out looking at 18 to 24 months. They're leaning more towards the 24 month. Um, there are eco regional based large areas. Um, one scale we were looking at initially was, you know, did it in involve more than two or three BLM field officers? And then the assessment is to understand the conditions and how they may be altered um, by ongoing changes in demands. Um, REAs are information gathering, assessment of the natural resources and characteristics, um, how, eco how, they, how ecological resources function at, the, at a landscape scale, understanding the status of those resources, and then the potential for those um, to change at the landscape scale. Um, REAs, the information going into REAs are existing information. There's no um, new data collection, you know, as part of the process. So it's looking at what exists out there that you can use to inform your landscape or your landscape assessment. The information is um, generally at the landscape regardless of political boundaries or land status, and it's just a snapshot of what's going on at the eco region. And a few potential uses for the REAs and BLM. Um, we're looking to, to look at the, the REAs to inform and enhance our local management. How do we place our local decisions into a, a landscape context and understand, you know, the, um, the, I guess, to understand the potential um, impacts of our decisions or the opportunities that may exist out there for us to meet our management, our desired goals in our current planning. Um, BLM field office maintain their central role in the management of public lands. They continue to develop and implement local management strategies and to implement their land use plans. Um, all that will still occur, and now we're just taking a look at it at, a, at the landscape scale. Um, the broader perspective to provide through the landscape approach will help focus and integrate these local managements. You know, an example of that is how can two field offices ensure that they're managing say, resources for desert tortoise similar across boundaries and, and not have the boundary of their field office be a cutoff. Um, and so we're just looking at different ways to use the REAs to inform that. Another way to use the REAs is potentially in a cumulative effects analysis is to place our resources and our decisions into a landscape, you know, context to help us understand the magnitude of, of our impacts or even of our proactive activities and give us more bang for the buck as far as resources. The land use, um, land use, the landscape approach and land use plans. Um, BLM has completed several efforts with the solar um, EIS and sage grouse efforts. So we don't really think of the REAs as requiring us to amend plans, instead providing information to help us inform where we need to go in our planning or in our implementation. REAs are not decision documents, so it's purely an information gathering document. And so it's, it provides new information at a landscape scale, but it's not meant to be a decision document. Um, it could lead to managers making a decision to readdress an, is, an issue, um, but it's, there's no requirement for plan amendments based on information from the rapid ecoregional assessments. Currently, um, in, two well, in 2010, seven REAs were initiated. The Sonoran, Mojave, and uh, Central 
uh, in the Colorado Plateau and Central Great Basin were the ones that's you know close to our management areas are concerned within the desert LCC area. Those are completed and are available, uh, currently available. Okay. Um, three REAs initiated in 2011 and four in 2012. Yeah, I'm on another but webinar. Sorry. It's okay. The no problem. The Madran Archipelagos um, is currently one of the 2004 REAs that were initiated, and it's moving along. We expect to have it actually completed in 2014 next year. And so that's the current stage of our REAs. And I was just going to pause. Do we make sure everybody has their phone on, on mute? Okay. Um, ecological values. So REAs look at ecological values at the landscape. Um, these values we call conservation elements. They can be regionally important terrestrial ecosystems, regionally important aquatic systems, and native fish and wildlife and plants of regional concern. Um, all REAs at a minimum will address those three um, points um, for conservation, ele uh, conservation elements. Um, ecological integrity is an attempt for us to get at a status and at the landscape. And so that's a component that each REA is attempting to um, provide information or help us understand what the current condition at the landscape scale would, would look like. And I'll go into a little more detail on that a little later. Conservation elements. So for the Colorado Plateau, there are eight ecological systems. Um, the Mojave Basin Range, there's 19, and the Sonoran Desert has two. The Sonoran Desert only has two because the um, Palo Verde mixed cacti and the creosote burst age makes up 76% 70, of the ecoregion, and that's the reason why we only have a limited number here. Um, the other thing to consider about the conservation elements is that it's, it's based on a coarse filter, fine filter approach. And so the attempt of the REAs were to look at more of a coarse filter and see and to to make sure it stays at the landscape scale and not get into more local issues. There are some um, smaller terrestrial systems that um, comprised of the aquatics, uh, riparian and springs, and so those were kind of similar across the landscape to kind of tackle the aquatic question. And here's an example for the Mojave, um, kind of the coarse filters um, <clears throat> that were utilized and how they, what percentage they made up of the ecoregion. Okay, another um, component of the REA assessment was conservation of conservation elements were species. So each REA looked at a select few species that were, the attempt was to look at species that represented a part of the landscape or were, or captured part of the, um, I guess a part of the landscape that may have fell through from the, if you look purely at the systems of vegetative communities. And so it was a way to kind of capture from a species how they would, uh, their requirements across the, um, the landscape, um, at the landscape scale. And so the snoring um, just a group in the show, we had mammals, birds, and reptiles for Sonoran Mojave. And similar numbers for the Madran Archipelagos, I just didn't include it in this, in this slide. Um, also, another look that, look the REAs, another approach the REAs took was, um, they looked at soils, and soils were used as a way to try to gauge potentially sensitive soils related to um, rare plant communities, and so you'll see that in some information provided in the Mojave and in the Sonora. And <clears throat> this group of species here are just showing species that crossed um, both the Colorado, um, not the Colorado Plateau, excuse me, um, they crossed the Mojave and the Sonoran REA. So just where we had species that occurred in both assessment areas. All good. Woo. <laughs> I thought I could do 
it before. Oh, okay, good call. Because it was on the second that it expired. Oh, very good call. Okay. Hi. No, it's a uh, Somebody can put their phone on mute. Thank you. Um, another component of the REAs is change agents. Um, change agents, um, all REAs address four change agents at a minimum, and that's wildland fire, invasive species, development, and climate change. Um, change agents, <clears throat> if, if you had a, I guess we're, you're not, you, um, each REA were, was not limited to um, the four change agents, but at a minimum they have to address those. If you had an issue that would occur at the landscape that you wanted to address, for instance, if you had an uh, issue with in insects or, or disease, then that can also be assessed in your assessment. So you weren't limited to the four, but at a minimum you had to address the four change agents. And and this is just a break a little more detail to show like for the, the development um component of the change and what went into um assessing development um in the REAs. Uh, management questions are a key component of the REAs. The management questions questions focus more on kind of the where are they kind of questions and and how they've been impacted by certain change agents. And um, so all REAs use management questions to help focus the assessment and to um, help guide the priorities in the assessment. There are a total of 62 management questions that were assessed in the Mojave and 32 management questions for the Sonoran. The assessment time frame, so we looked at current conditions, um, looked at near-term projects, which is 2025, and that focus was on the development scenario. Um, the mid-century projections out to 30 to 60 years um, to 2050 were based on climate change um, to look at how we can assess potential changes in climate. Um, these maps here are just illustration of the uh, reporting units that were used. The REAs looked at a four kilometer scale and a fifth level hydrologic unit. Um, the four kilometer scale was used to align the outputs with the um, the climate change information that was downscale in the assessments. Okay. Um, conceptual models and spatial models are a major component of the REAs to help um, assess how change agents and conservation elements are interacting across the landscape and to come up with the ecological status or current condition. Um, the, this here is an example for um, the contractor, NatureServe was one of the contractors that addressed the Central Basin and the Mojave Basin and Range Assessment, and so this is their approach and how they looked at um, their conceptual model and the next, this right here is an output of looking at landscape condition modeling at 90 meters for Mojave. And this is kind of the human footprint, kind of our human disturbance scale. And I can't, um, I can't really help with the colors <laughs> on it. Hopefully they're, they're pretty clear. And Elroy, um, can you tell me what the colors mean? Yeah. That those are the least impacted by all of the change agents combined, is that correct? Yeah, um, I know, I'll go off of memory. So the red and orange areas are, yeah, the most impacted. The scale itself is just there for representing. You have to get a little more detail in the full report. But the in general, the red and orange are the most impacted 
and um, the darker greens are the least impacted. And I'm sorry on that because I'm colorblind between red and green. <laughs> Thank you. But I've tried to use, I, I prefer more hash marks, but, and so that's just, and this is more just a representation. We'll get a little more detail as we go into the model um, a, a little later. And moving to this conceptual model here is what Dynamac used for the Sonoran. And the, and it, so it, it outlines the inputs that goes into terrestrial intactness. And terrestrial intactness or landscape intactness is similar to the landscape condition model that NatureServe used. And so it's just a different labeling, but they're similar. And it just shows the weighting that went into it and the inputs that went into it. One thing to point out that each one of these boxes in the process, and it's similar for um, NatureServe, is a map. And so you can get intermediate maps that you can go in and, and look at as you build a you know, the final product or the final output. And so each one of these boxes, again, is a, is a map representation is, is tied to it in the model. And I'll show you, we'll, show, we'll look into that a little later in the presentation. And so here's what intactness um, look like, looks like at the four kilometer scale, um, based on inputs of all of the change agents um, across the equal region. And the hexagon shows the percentages of the intactness across the equal region. It's just to show a different way to kind of report the the outputs. Um, and and I'll back up a little bit. The one of the reasons why we went initially with different contractors was to try to have the contractors come up with different approaches that we could evaluate, you know, at at a later date or in the next step to see which one, you know, addressed an issue or tackled an issue. So it just gave us more tools to evaluate in the you know for future use. Um, initially, the REAs. We thought we would have more time between individual assessments, but that time, we haven't had time to go back and really evaluate all. That's kind of our next step is evaluating these outputs and the different tools to see which one best represents or answer the, the management question that, that we may have in an area. The other thing I wanted to point out also, and I'll go see if I can get this to go back here. And so the invasive species in this model I don't have a, I guess, okay, there we go. So the invasive species part of the model here um, really influences by the weighting of 80-20, and what it shows up is this right here is based upon Sahara mustard. And so it's just one of those things that just, you have to know the inputs that's going in, and based on the question you have, you know, how much you want to weight invasive species when you're looking at intactness. So, so those are some of the things that you can actually go into the model and tweak and, you know, and modify to kind of get a better look at or even potentially refine the, the data input to, to, get, to get it more, I guess, with better local data. Because one of the limitations of the REAs is that we use data that was comparable across the eco region. And so you can go in and add better data to the models, rerun it, and then, you know, relook at it. And it, a lot of it depends upon the question. Like, again, example, like with this one here, is that looking at invasive mustard, that may not be a high enough issue as far as when we're looking at a potential impact from a solar development field or where we should put solar. You wouldn't want mustards to be one of the drivers that send it into an area, so you would want to take a closer look at that. Um, and also, so for the Sonoran Desert, we also ran the information at a one kilometer scale, and you can see how it kind of refines from the pixels. Um, and so they're still looking at the intactness at the one kilometer scale. And so we have it both in one kilometer and four kilometers. So this was a step down effort after the assessment, but the information is available. Um, Okay, and also just to let you know, so the Colorado Plateau also is rerunning their 
output at a one kilometer scale, which would also cover the whole state of Utah, and that's been um, done by our Utah State Office. And so you'll have one kilometer data to actually access even for the Colorado Plateau. And here's the next slide here is just showing some of the outputs. So this is looking at current intactness based upon designated lands, and this is at the four kilometer scale. And so just looking at designated lands or things in the protected um, area database, which is your wilderness areas, um, national monuments, and those type of designations that are more federally are, are get a higher stature than just a normal land use plan. So it just gives you an idea to look at how your land is intact. And again, you can go into the model and figure out what's driving the changes in the landscape. <clears throat> and this is right here just showing from the, with the histograms, how the different, you can break out the data to look at, you know, refuges, national monuments, you know, how your wilderness study areas. And an interesting one that shows up is at the state parks is showing that it's a lot least in I guess there's more impacts potentially, but it's more of a scale issue probably in the location of where your state parks are to cities. And so that's just an influence of the model, but it's just different ways to look at the outputs uh, from an intactness. And the products in the Sonoran will also have similar histograms dealing with climate change. And this is an example of four kilometers. So this is looking at more designation that are um, tied to BLM land use plans. So we can look at our desert tortoise habitat categorization in our land use plans and how they're looking as far as an intactness or, and, you know, are the movement corridors. So there's different ways to, to kind of get at um, seeing the data. And just another output just to show, you know, some of the outputs you get from the data. So you can break out and look at designated areas. You can look at total area and then figure out what percentage on BLM land that, you know, that we have for Mojave tortoise at 30%. So it just kind of sets you up in the landscape as far as what percentage of the landscape or how important your area may be in the landscape to meet certain species needs. And these are just examples. You can do this with almost any category. Okay, the next couple of slides um, is just showing how to access the data. And this is where I'm, and so all of the data for, for the REAs are on a BLM SharePoint and it's accessible through the web. And so I'm gonna see if I can actually get there. So I'm, Change here real quick. I guess if there, any, while I'm changing, is there any questions so far? Everybody's on mute. So if, if you go to BLM's national web page, <clears throat> and under what we do, it'll take you to a, a list of action that, and so under there, there's a, a access to the BLM's landscape um, approach web page. And so it just gives you a lot of um, background information of the REAs and the process and, and access to data. And so here's the data portal. X. And so you can go in and access the data portal. You have to read and, and sign a disclaimer. And this right here is actually just from the public website, so this is not internal. And so then there's access for if you're a BLM DOI personnel or if you want to just use an arc map and so all of the rea information is um, 
available as, as is released. And so you can go in and you can look at the data catalog, maps, and models, or you can download the full report. Eleanor, and also, this is Genevieve. Yes. Sorry. Um, is that is, is the information available to non outside of DOI? Yes. This right here from this spot, this is coming from outside, so this anybody can access it. Okay. The 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 difference is more of if you're in DOI, you can log in and it is more just of the SharePoint sites or you can get into um I guess a a little more, you can do a little more as far as with the data in the site, but you still get access to the same, they get access to the same information. It's just more of how it's presented. And so if you go into, you find a Sonoran. If you click on the Sonoran, it gives you the details about the Sonoran. And what I want to show here. Okay, sorry about that. Um, what I want to show here is so we have the final reports, but you also have access to the different processes and as we were building the REA. So um, there were different interim products that you have access to the, the, the data sets, you know, for analysis. So under this PDF, that's all the data that was analyzed and what was, you know, recommended to go forward. It talks to you about how we selected um, change agents, um, management questions. So here's a way to get at the background of what went into the REA. And so it's just another source of um, kind of the, the information that helped build the REAs. Okay, and um, let me go back here. Okay. And so when you go in, this is what the map catalog would look like. And so this is just a, a snapshot for the Sonoran. And so there's eight pages here and it's based upon, I know it's a little hard to read, but it's based upon the management question here and then a little description. But then you can either open it in ArcGIS on the line, online or you can go in um, through um, just the map service. And, and so you have different ways of viewing it. So if you prefer to look at it through Google Earth or um, display it on Google Earth, you can do that. And if you're in the SharePoint site, it's just an example of what the data kind of would look like um, and how to access. So it would be broken down by management questions that are addressed and then change agents. And I'll give an, uh, an example of the map service here. So the, the report you can download is in PDF. And so if you in, within if you hover over a map within the report and you click on it, it actually will take open up the map service from the PDF report. It's actually working pretty fast today. So. And so now you you can. You can manipulate the data, see the data, and go here. And so it lets you know what's being shown. So you can look at all the input that went into the assessment. So you can, it allows you to manipulate the map and just kind of see what's behind it. Um, And this right here just kind of, I'll let you um, just show what, you know, kind of the 
what's being displayed at the time of your legend. So just a way to access the information and look at it um, in, a, in a map service. I guess any questions on, on that part? Oh, Roy, this is Amy Robertson. Um, yeah. I had a question about, you may have said this, uh, unfortunately my computer shut down for updates in the middle, so I got a little distracted, but how did you come up with the management questions that informed those maps and, and spatial information? So, so all the, um, for the REAs, there were, um, the REAs are, was set up with a team, there's an assessment management team, which is the Branch chief for BLM usually is the, the chair of it, but all the management questions were developed through either forums or workshops where we um, worked with the contractor and the contractor worked with our partners to kind of identify what issues and what questions were out there. The Sonoran and Mojave, there was an initial set of BLM management questions that were put out, you know, initiated it, and then those were refined through the process. Um, also included in, in that process is there was, um, I don't know if I mentioned it, USGS was the peer reviewer for the, the overall assessment, but they also participate on the technical teams to help as we were developing some of the management questions. Um, but there is a, a write-up or a memo that are a detail for each REA how that process took place. Great, thank that you. Answered for you. Yeah. Yes, thanks. And so, continuing on the um, so the critical management questions, um, I pull these from um, the report that that Amy you you provided me, and um, I guess initially just looking at it from the REA um, standpoint, I mean, there's a lot in your in the questions as far as there's a lot of I guess sub questions or question, you know, throughout. And one way for the REAs is to look at how the REAs align with some of our existing management questions with the question that are identified in the critical management question one. Um, the climate change questions and how they interact is a lot of um, how the REAs, I mean, a major part of the REAs is trying to address that, looking at aquatic riparian and a, in a select set of species that we identified as management um, conser uh, species conservation elements in the plan. And so I think the REAs provide that information as an initial start to start looking at how well or how did the REAs address some of those questions. And what I was going to try to do here is that if we go to that, that catalog, So if we go to the catalog, in the, well, you can actually go in and just look at the subset of, cl of climate change questions, what they address and how they, um, what data is tied to it, and look at that as a starting point. And so I think the, the RIAs will provide information to help, I guess, move these questions forward or see how it, how it fits. One thing I wanted to show also as I'm jumping around here a little bit, is from a BLM planning standpoint, so this is just a look at um, how some of the more local land use plan decisions um, fit across the landscape that may help with some of the um, critical management questions. And so for, for Arizona, and I'll just click these on, so if we look at how BLM is identifying tortoise, these hash marks in different colors is all the areas where BLM in their current planning have decisions that um, address desert tortoise management and some of the areas like category one and two could have restrictions on it as no surface occupancy and so there's different land restrictions 
that affect what activities can occur in those areas. And it's just kind of to show how the land is already kind of under current management is already allocated for different species or different um, priorities. Um, I don't know if you could tell, but I added in some plans have already identified some important corridor areas that would require like a closer look. And then some wildlife areas. And so it just, it gets pretty cloudy pretty quick as far as all the different overlays that are ongoing out there. And and add one more BLM ACECs. And so this information is, it wasn't available consistently across the whole REA, so it's more of a step down effort to step it down and see what's in local planning, but we can do the similar for California, you know, <clears throat> and even into New Mexico, depends on, you know, just gathering information from their current planning. And another example I wanna show here real quick. And I guess to, to tie to like one of the criti critical management questions while I'm opening up another map here is, and so when we're looking at what species are priority or what's going on, this is a way to start looking at what species are currently um, a priority by land managers and similar information should be available for like the Forest Service or other land management groups. So this right here, the, what I just clicked on there is looking at intactness and this is based upon where our current land use plans have um, decisions related to movement corridors. And, and this is a look right here at priority wildlife habitat and land use plans and how it looks based upon um, the intactness layer. And then this is just an overall look again at the intactness layer across the ecoregion. Okay. Any questions there? So this was just looking at, so what we were looking at earlier was primarily from the Sonoran, looking at um, what databasing, um, not databasing, but what um, Dynamac had used to address kind of intactness. And this is just a look now at some of the outputs to, from the um, Mojave using the map service. And so this is just coming from the report, you can get to these maps here and figure out what layers you may need if you wanted to download a specific layer. And 
So for critical management question two, um, the focus there as looking at the climate change and stresses, so like the intactus layer, we do have um, different outputs and appendices that will help kind of at least show, I guess, the how the climate models used by the different contractors for BLM and what information is available for climate across both Sonoran and the Mojave. Um, the information input that went into the climate layers, um, they started with a Hostetler and they downscaled the information. So the climate information for all the REAs in the West currently is the same data set. And one of the questions, I guess, as a next step is how do we begin looking at the different climate um, efforts that have downscaled information and, <clears throat> and kind of overlay and seeing what, which models agree, disagree, or what some of the outputs are, and, you know, kind of move forward as to the next, um, what's the next kind of step, or, or where do we take the assessments or the information, you know, to make it more useful for um, our local managers? And a lot of it is how do we interpret and make sure that we're interpreting it correctly across the scale to help inform our local managers. Um, this part is more, I guess, a, a question is, is, I don't know if there's questions or if, we, if there's things specifically we want to look at to help get at some of the qu management questions from the, the team or? Yeah, hi, Elroy, this is Amy again. Um, I, I have a question first and then sound like you were asking a question as well. So um, in, in what you were just talking about in maybe a next step at looking at downscaled climate models and um, trying to incorporate them into some of these uh, data layers and, and assessments, is that something that BLM um, is planning to do or just sort of a discussion you're having? I, I'm curious. That sounds like uh, pretty valuable information. I think it's... Um in some form or another, um, is, is something we're, we're trying to figure out how to do in 14 and kick off. One of the things that BLM, our task is coming up with a, we call it more of an opportunities document and kind of reporting opportunities from the RIAs. And other, other states are looking to the LCCs to kind of help with that report to kind of see where we go next. And I think but to come up with some strategy of how we're going to address um, climate change and how it fits in from the RIA data is, is a next step we want to try to explore within this next year. Um, and so that, but trying to figure out how do we integrate that into the process of what the LCC is working on. Right. It's, it's that would be great. I think we'd love to partner with you on that. <laughs> um, so then, yeah, you were looking at these specific management questions. Did you want to show how we might look to what's available to help answer some of these questions? Or, like, for example, um, critical management question number two, what yeah. the team that's currently working on that um, is trying to prioritize which threats they're going to focus on. They've, they've decided to really focus on climate change, but specifically what are some of the change drivers that are related directly to climate change or expected to have a strong interaction with climate change. So we could look to your assessment, perhaps, and see what are the change drivers that you've already identified that are related to climate change? Yes. And so, and that's like the attackness layer would be one of these uh, starting points because the, the thing that's driving that is the development, is climate change. And so you have those at least what layers are available that we could find at the landscape that's driving that model and some of the model in, you know input so it, it'll help hopefully help refine some of the questions in relation to um, species but let me go to a development map here So as 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 so as the group work on that and refine the questions, how do you I guess what level of detail are you trying to get to as far as like for climate? So what is there a specific I guess focus for climate or you know 
The team's actually in the middle of a process right now to answer that question. Okay. So what they're looking at is um, looking at threats caused by climate change as well as ones that are expected to interact with climate change and um, going through a process to decide which ones they're really going to focus on, which seem to be the greatest threat in our area um, and that sort of thing. Okay. So, so this this map here is is kind of the development, at least a high development footprint that went into the Sonoran REA and a similar one for um, Mojave. Um, and so, as a starting point, it, you can see the different layers that went into that. The the one step that that I think will will help is is trying to integrate the <clears throat> the current management direction that's in the that the land management agencies are, I guess, expecting or desired outcomes or future they're trying to get to on their lands and how that may influence and change. Um, in the report, it talks about in the Mojave how, you know, a large percentage of the Mojave is already in protected status or some level of protected status, and so it kind of gives you um, a starting point, at least of acres, of what that looked like and where and where do you anticipate the change. Um, I was trying to get to one of the climate ones. So, okay. So here is um, it's just a quick the, a component of the, Mahog the the model that went into the energy development, and so with the different inputs that went into that process, um, with the, with the corresponding map and outputs. And so here is the end rail, and I'll open it up into a larger map. So we, so we have interim products where you have the potential for energy on top of climate change, potential changes, and, um, <clears throat> and then depending on what conservation element, if it's a vegetative community or a habitat, if there's something outside of the, the way we group the veg communities, then you can add that information into, you know, more of a step-down assessment to kind of help inform that question. If, does that make sense there? Or? Yeah, I think so. I There's so much information here. Um, that's pretty cool would definitely take me a while to uh, orient myself to how to use it. Yeah, the, the one thing in the appendix and the appendices for the reports and the information, so you, there's more where you can focus on a specific management question than all of the inputs that went to it. So there's ways to break up the information and how you access it so you don't try to grab, you know, the whole report. And so you can go through the appendices and actually narrow it down to a specific question or an area or in habitat type, and then all the information tied to that would kind of be available to you. Well, that's helpful. Thanks. Yeah, so that's taking a little longer than I thought it would to Let's open up. Okay. And so with the, and before I leave this, so with the, these management questions, those 32 in, in the Sonoran and the 62 for Mojave, um, so those questions can align pretty closely. I just haven't, I didn't have a chance to, I was hoping to get it into a spreadsheet, the crosswalk, but I didn't get a chance to get that done before the presentation. But that's one step as to, as a starting point, is just crosswalking those questions, and then you'll have the associated um, data and outputs that the REAs at least found to try to get at those questions. Uh, another source is we began downloading some of the information from the ILAP data 
and so they have a lot of information on climate and some of the same stressors um, in their assessment. And so we can see if there's if there's um, information that was missed by one or the other. I just hadn't had a chance to do that before the presentation. That's great. So we're, did you all use some of the ILAP information in your analyses as well? Um, the ILAP, we didn't use it because they were being developed almost simultaneously. We we shared information along the way as far as the input because I know they participated in a couple of our um, workshops. And so we, we shared in that sense um, as we were developing, but they were kind of on the same track when they were being developed. And and so just uh, some thoughts that the, the landscape approach, you know, I think it will inf inform and enhance our local management and help us put it in the context for either NEPA or even future, you know, um, future decisions and direction that, you know, you may want to go with a resource. Um, one of the things we're hoping to try to work on is how do you use this information to kind of inform potential listing, you know, package, packages or, you know, even commenting on potential designated critical habitat, those type of where you're looking for information, how do we use this information to kind of frame the current status of a species that may come up um, and tie it back to what the potentials of the habitat is and what are the potential threats, you know, in these different future time zones or uh, time sections for climate change and development. And so we're, we're working on trying to figure out how to step that down now to, to make it useful and inform, you know, some of these current uh, efforts that's ongoing. Um, all the RIAs, you know, they're a little different based upon issues and focus, but there's a lot of overlap in information. But there is a lot of information available geospatially, and this is only looking at the landscape. And so if you go to our land use plans and what went into those, there's more localized information that also help inform. So it's just a matter of, I guess, framing a few questions and then kind of walking through those questions. That would be great if we could do that, <laughs> work with you on that. I, I like the idea of crosswalking what you all have done with the REAs and, and what the Forest Service has done with ILAP and looking at how we can use those to inform our management questions. I think that's a great idea. You know, I'm, do we have time for another question? I, I do have another yeah, one and yeah. others may too. I've been asking most of the questions here. but. Um, one thing I'm wondering, I know that these, um, the REAs are really a very new product, um, but I'm curious if you're getting any feedback from your field offices yet in terms of what they find, what they're finding particularly useful. Um, or is it just too, too soon to be assessing that? A, a lot is too soon, but one of, one of the things that we're in, a couple of offices have tried, um, to kind of step it down. And I think the one thing, I guess, a lesson learned or kind of thing we're, we're finding is that is folks want to clip the information to their area, and then when they do that, they kind of lose the landscape context, you know. And so we're just figuring out a ways to kind of inform how to use the data and the limitations of it as far as the scale of use. So we're working on trying to get more direction and guidance and training out on that aspect of it to hopefully help the field in, inform. Um, we had one office where a was able to use the um, the soils information to help inform like one of the travel management plans and where they may have a, a dust issue and come up with best management practice. So there was one local use of you know some of the data that was in the REA. Um, one one thing that we really I guess I would really stress would be that looking at the REAs as a as a tool. And that, that there's a lot of information in there, but the tools are there, you know, to be used and, and get feedback on so we can kind of improve them as we go go along. But it, the REAs and the, even the reports are kind of more of an example of what the REA potential is than it is a final, here's a, the current status. It's more of, you know, just kind of outlined the potential use of those tools that help build it. And then what we want is this, how we as we keep going forward, how do we refine it and how we share those tools and kind of improve on them? Great. So you're doing trainings or workshops um, for folks at the field level and how to, how to use this? Is that what you said? Yeah, we're going to, well, they're going to kick off for kind of a train the trainer 
to get at least um, a few folks, a GIS specialist and, you know, um, a resource specialist, at least a couple within each uh, ecoregion or each state, and then hopefully from that team we'll be going out this year and, and kind of giving that training. And will that be open uh, to BLM only, or, or will the other partners, do you have the capacity to invite other partners to that? I think there will be some capacity to invite other partners as we try to roll it out. Uh, and they're still, they're also working on at the NOC, uh, I guess, YouTube videos <laughs> to kind of help train and kind of walk you through the effort. They're looking at different tools cool. to, to kind of get it out there. Great. Well, definitely let us know if there's uh, training opportunities available. I, I def I'd be interested, and I, I'm sure others from our science working group would be as well. Okay. And, and I, I will do that because there's, there's a chance that even when they do the initial training, if there's a, a web component, um, there may be a webinar that we can you can at least you know participate on. Yeah, I think that would be really useful. And I, I guess for the uh, a question I would throw out, I guess for the the, the working group or is relates to um, when you're looking at like species and um, coming up with priority species, what's the best way for us to kind of integrate species that make up a priority for, uh, you know, through our land use plans or whether it's the state wildlife action plan or even, you know, which ones should would, would represent a better landscape type species and kind of refine that. What would be a way to kind of begin to tackle that question or frame it? That's a great question. Um, I, I'm not sure if we have an answer for it, at right <laughs> the moment, but I think it's definitely something, um, and one of the reasons we wanted to have the webinar and record it so that we could kind of explore these next steps and these next options. Um, the species one, the change agents or the stressors, um, I think are both of those areas where we need to look into integration a little bit more. Yeah. Okay. And, and then um, we'll we'll set up some a thing, Elroy. Maybe that's something that Amy and I can can meet with you and and explore okay. that a little bit more. Okay. No, that, that sounds good, because um, one of the things is, in a, and the reason why I brought in the land use plan information is just trying to show how you have this ecoregional look, but even when we did our REAs, we missed the, we didn't include our current planning, and so some of the questions and some of the decisions probably are, have already been addressed at some, some level, at the local level, so how do we start to show that, you know, across the landscape? And so the reason why I just want to show that that map being so, I guess, busy was to just show that there's not a lot of space that, you know, if if a project or, you know, even like solar projects, those things have to go through those kind of, I guess, through that maze in order to, to get developed. There's a lot of constraints out there on the land. And if we go into our land use plan, there's more direction as far as desired condition and different objectives that would drive where we would do things, and it would even inform where we would do restoration. Um, and that, oh, before we go, I did want to show one of those real quick. I almost forgot. There was a kind of mitigation opportunities. So here's the, I want to open it up. So here's just a, a scale of re with renewable energy potential and where you would potentially go in Mojave. And they looked at this from a refugia standpoint also. So there's information on if you were looking for refugia and how it may be impacted by potential climate change or energy development. So just kind of helping inform where potential regional mitigation strategies could go. And, and the part that we would add to that as you step it down is building in that local information from the land use plans as to what would further drive where you would do mitigation to meet other objectives. And so I just wanted to show that as a as another output that's in the in the document. And so 
any other, any other questions from the group or this is Amy I'll just say I it's really an impressive tool a bunch uh, really so much information that's been pulled together here I, I look forward to learning more about it and working with you to see um, you know how we can start using it with our critical management questions and you know, I know that the Refuges Program for Fish and Wildlife Service is um, very interested in looking at larger scale landscape conservation design in their own planning efforts. And, you know, I think there's probably a lot of valuable information here that they, they could be using as well. Um, and Elroy, this is Genevieve. Can, this is more of a, a technical question, but what vegetation information did you use to determine your community? Um, the, the vegetative community, they, they use the combination. Sonoran used land fire and, and nature serve, an, an, uh, ecological systems, I think it is, a product there. And, and there was some regap. And so the, the, there's a crosswalk, or if I take that back, no, nature, for Sonoran, they used both, and they just presented both and let you see the overlap where they agreed and disagreed in some of the products. And so you have access to both layers. But generally, it's a, a land fire or regap layer. And in working with um, your managers, has that been sufficient, or are there other issues associated with that data? Yeah, there, there's concern with the accuracy of, of land fire. And I think, at least right now, the way we're kind of approaching is, is as we get new information, you know, we're hopefully that would inform a refresh of land fire or even regap. And so it's more of a validation now of, um, I guess, of the veg communities <coughs> and to kind of help inform and, I guess, improve that layer. Um, the other thing is, and, and it's one of those things of just knowing that at this scale you can't go down to a mountain range and, and really have the accuracy. So it's more of just a broad snapshot or picture of, of where the communities are and, and not, a, you know, so you can't go down to that local level. And so we just got to explain that limitation of the data. Great. Thank you. Are there other questions from folks on the phone? Well, I'd like to thank Elroy for presenting to us today. And um, again, this webinar will be recorded, so people will have the ability to kind of go back and, and look at all the information that was provided. Um, and we'll be exploring um, in the future ways to integrate a lot of this information into what the LCC is already doing, as well as see where the LCC can help support um, these types of efforts across the landscape. So I wanted to again thank Elroy and thanks everybody else for being on the phone and for attending today. If you do have any other questions um, after the webinar, if things come to mind, um, Elroy, would would you be available by email or is there? Yeah, by one? email. Um, and I didn't put my number, but I'm on the BLM directory. Okay. Um, so we could send an email um, to either myself or Amy um, or Elroy. Yes. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Elroy. Thanks, everyone. No problem. Thanks.